Hi, my name is Ginger Broderick, and I'm the host of the Ginger New York TV show. We're here at the Manhattan Neighborhood Network on West 59th Street in Manhattan. Thank you for joining in with us. This is a previously taped show because my guest is very busy and world traveling. So we got her in a little bit earlier during the summertime uh, in order to talk about her life, her father, the late Eddie Durham, and we want to talk about his legacy. So please welcome Topsy Durham. Hi, Ginger. Hey, How are you? thank you very much for coming in today. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes. Fitting me into your schedule. Oh, and <laughs> me into your schedule. I think that's more of the issue. Yeah. 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 But thank you so much for coming in today. You know, you're you're a musical family. You know, generations of it. You have a famous father, and it's really nice that we can play pay tribute to him. Um, thank you. Because of all the work that he's done from the early in the 19, 1930s, correct? Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. 1930s and up to the 80s, actually. So you're Eddie Durham's daughter. I'm his daughter, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was born in San Marcos, Texas in 1906, but one has to remember it's the age of the mother, not the age of the father. Uh -huh. So yes, he uh, would be over 100 years old now. But my And that would make you about 80, and I yeah, don't think would, you look yeah. 80. And, um, <laughs> you know, I age well. <laughs> there you go. Oh, <laughs> my mom is now in her 70s, uh -huh. and uh, she's living, you know, lives in New York as Wonderful. well. Wonderful. Wonderful. But I just got word from uh, his hometown, uh, San Marcos, uh, that they are building a park in his honor, in right, in, right in the, on the block where he was born. Oh, wonderful! Um, it's actually Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Oh, uh, wonderful! In in the Dunbar area of San Marcos, Texas. And how large so, is this town of San Marcos? It's small. Uh, the largest population there are the students at Texas State University. Okay. They have about forty thousand students. Okay. And um, it's a, it's a small town, but it's in the middle of. Uh, Austin and San Antonio. Okay. You can a actually land in either airport and then drive to San Marcos. And what is it, about an hour or so? Yeah, it's then? about an hour each way, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. a Wonderful. More, a little more from San, San Antonio. But. So he was born in the early 1900s. Right, and, and he died in 1987 mm -hmm. in New York. Okay. And um, so I wanted to cover today some things that uh, not necessarily you know, found uh, on the internet because the research you can do on uh, DurhamJazz.com, which is a website that I um, started about 15 years ago, and I just add information and add information um, for researchers, students, professors, and for myself as well when I have to do interviews because, you know, the memory <laughs> is not what it used to be. And it's, it's a lot to go over. It's a lot to remember. My father was not just a musician or a composer. You know, he was also an arranger, he was a trombonist, guitarist, he also um, did choreography uh, for the bands when they were doing the flag waving with the horns oh, and the hats. Interesting. And that's that's a lot of my father's work mm -hmm. and um, he mentored some all women's bands in the 1940s during World War II and he also mentored Charlie Christian, you know, who was who's, uh, heralded as the first electric guitarist but actually he uh, my dad was the first electric guitarist, the first to record on electric guitar. Mm -hmm. and, and about what year was that? Uh, that was in 1935 mm -hmm. on a song called Hitting the Bottle, mm -hmm. which he did not write um, with the Jimmy Lunch Lunsford Orchestra. Mm -hmm. That was the, I'm sorry, that was the amplified guitar recording. The um, electric guitar recordings were in 1938 on a, a session that was produced by John Hammond Sr. Uh, for my father to showcase the electric guitar. Mm -hmm. And some of the first uh, solos are on there, but it's the first recordings of electric guitar as well. Mm -hmm. And that the, the session was originally called Eddie Durham and His Bass Four. And they did um, four or five recordings, uh, 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 songs. And it didn't sell and the record company also got sold and uh, so the new label says well we can't put it out with just four or five songs so they brought in Lester Young, added Les Lester Young and it became the Kansas City Five. Oh interesting. So it went from the Eddie Derriman and his bass four mm -hmm. to Kansas City Five with Lester Young and it was it's now famous and it's known as the, the Lester Young Sessions. But if you read the liner notes, you'll see that there are four or five songs on there. I think it's four songs 
um, with that Lester is not on and that have an earlier date earlier that year mm -hmm. and then Lester was added later in the year I think I have a picture of the, the album cover we can take a break yeah here mm -hmm. it is it looks like that on the bottom so um, I'll send you that. oh isn't that interesting and, yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Kansas City mm -hmm. Sessions. So he was the first to record on amplified guitar on contraptions that he made himself. And then he was the first to record on electric guitar. And he also was the first to record single line solos, which he did with Benny Moten's orchestra in the early 1930s. I guess that was around nine, uh, 32, uh, 33 maybe. Might have been earlier than that. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, <coughs> Also recordings he didn't write, New Vine Street Blues, uh, Spanish Stomp, and um, Rumba Negro, I think it's called. Um, so there was, you know, there's a lot of firsts for him. Um, my how, did, did, how did he get involved with music? Okay, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Not that it's, I mean to sidetrack you, no, but... No, it's, it's, it's <clears throat> good that you asked me that, because his eldest brother, uh, Joe Jr., I don't know what year he was born, but he was born before 1900. He was um, musical director for Teddy Roosevelt's oh homecoming cavalry band, the Rough Riders, in Texas, where he learned, his brother learned to read and write read and notate music there. <clears throat> he taught all of his siblings to do the same when he came back. He taught them all how to play all the instruments they learned. Uh, my dad's father was a, a fiddler and he played the uh, square dances in Texas. Oh, interesting. So um, my father said that his father was a, a three things. He was a fiddler, he was a bronco, and he was a a uh, great whiskey drinker. So, you know, he was a party man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Sounds Texan, very Texan, yeah. Yes, Texan. <laughs> and he, um, the funny thing is that the kids, my father and his siblings, they would, they would somehow catch these rattlesnakes and take the rattles off of them and put them in the fiddle and it would amplify oh, the fiddle. Oh, good heavens. So, <laughs> so this amplification was something that my father was seemed to be obsessed with from you know really young age and um, I'm going to assume that was definitely his father's idea and um, so he learned music from his brother but they used to attend the square dances with their father so mm -hmm. I guess this is where his oldest brother learned you know mm -hmm. that he got an appreciation for music then um, they as they got a little older they joined the circuses Texas had a gigantic circus called the um, Doug Morgan's Traveling Circus, and he played banjo at the time, but he learned banjo and, uh, and trombone at the same time uh, from his brother, and um, they had a family band called the Durham Brothers Orchestra. They joined the circuses, the minstrels, and so that's great. how he learned to arrange for the brass bands. Eventually, they went to a bigger band called the 101 Wild Ranch Circus, which was bigger than uh, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. My. And as a matter of fact, the 101 Ranch Circus uh, uh, brought a lawsuit against the merger of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey because they said, you know, if they let them merge, then they would try to corner the market. Okay. And of course, obviously, they lost that lawsuit. Um, but uh, this this circus, they owned a ranch of, you know over a thousand acres and the performers were able to stay there and live there if they wanted amazing. and it was really pretty amazing but that's all on the website you can read about do you know what town that the this it was in oklahoma i believe oh, really? mm -hmm. i believe it was in oklahoma mm -hmm. yeah 101 wild ranch circus and um so from there he uh learned to arrange brass large brass and he knew how to read music, knew how to write music. This was very unusual for uh, an African American in those days. He learned how to, he learned uh, six-part harmony Isn't that before amazing? it was even known as six-part harmony, but in the circus it was, mm -hmm. um, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, from there he went to the um, the, the uh, Blue Devils Orchestra, Oklahoma Blue Devils Orchestra, and from the Oklahoma Blue Devils to Benny Moten's Orchestra, and, ben, and and when he came into Benny Moten's Orchestra, it was a really good band, but 
he came in and he changed the whole musical structure of that band and uh, started, you know, brought them into a modern, the modern, well, you can't call it modern because it, it didn't exist at the time, but he kind of brought them into a jazz modern age where they would become more swingable. And what about, uh, what age was he uh, about at this time? Uh, well, he was in the circus maybe at 12, 13. Oh, gee. Yeah. And he only spoke Spanish uh, because his the roots where they lived in Texas, he only spoke Spanish. He went on tour, on a tour bus with, um, it had to be Benny Moten's orchestra. And one of the trumpet players was an English teacher, taught oh him my. English on the bus. So a lot of his earlier compositions have Spanish names, like uh, uh, Rumba Negro has the name Spanish Stom, but it was in Spanish. It was written in Spanish. Yeah, interesting. And, yeah. Um, and he wrote a famous tune called Topsy. Yeah, he wrote <laughs> Topsy for, uh, uh -huh. the, at a base, Count Basie Orchestra did it first in 1938, made it famous, and mm -hmm. then... Cozy Cole re-released it in 1958 Wonderful. as a dr the first song as a drum solo major uh -huh. drum major solo song, uh -huh. um, and then it was used again 1970s in Star Wars Wonderful. in the cantina scene with the creatures playing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, now is Topsy your real name? Topsy is no, that's mm -hmm. not my mm -hmm. real name. But my, my father wanted me named Topsy. My mother said no. <laughs> <laughs> she says when you get the royalties for Topsy, you can change her name to Topsy. <laughs> but, uh, in later years, you know, I took it on as a nickname. Yeah, so. it's wonderful, very distinctive, yes. and thank you. you yeah. It's a secret code too. <laughs> or I guess I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but it's funny because when I meet uh, older people and I say Topsy, you know. They have a reaction, you know, to some other references Topsy meant in their day besides mm -hmm. the song. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then, of course, jazz aficionados say, oh, Topsy, that was a song, you know. Mm -hmm. So, and That's to make wonderful. people remember my name, I always say Topsy, not Turvy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> people who don't know top, the word Topsy or the name uh -huh. or the uh -huh. song. That's yes. great. Mm -hmm. I love to hear about the history of names. Right, yes. So your dad was a youngster, right? You know, 12, 15 years old. And I right. guess the circus was a way for people to travel around the country, too. Right, yes. Yeah. They did travel mm -hmm. all over. And through the work of the circus, that's how he learned right. so much music and the right. English language. Right. Wonderful. And the circus was a way for black musicians and white musicians to mingle. Mm -hmm. You know, even though the bands were separate. It, it wasn't like, okay, you went on the road with Glenn Miller and they don't allow black musicians in this band at this period. You know, the circus was a little looser because mm -hmm. it's a circus and, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, they could all stay on the ranch. And, and so after hours, they would all, they would mingle and they would go to the clubs and my father would write stuff for them and they would just, they would play it and they would charge at the door and, you know, and that's how he learned to write. Isn't that and, something? Uh, yeah. So eventually when he was around... 19, um, he was sent to an accelerated program for, uh, for African Americans in Chicago, um, which I understand Coleman Hawkins went to a few years later. And um, they were teaching harmonies there. And so, you know, he came in and he didn't finish the program because he pretty much knew as much as they did. And, you know, he says, well, I already know six-part harmony. I already, you know, it was mm -hmm. so, you know. Mm -hmm. He was very advanced at a very young age. That's you wonderful. Know, traveling. Uh, music education wasn't very much part of my family mm -hmm. life, and um, it, it created such a hunger for it for me. So right. I enjoy hearing all these stories right, and yes. certainly uh, patronizing and supporting live artists and live music. Right, yes. And, uh, so mm -hmm. it's great to have you here. Thank learning you. Learning about the history of jazz. Right. right? Yeah. So then after the Chicago stint, how did he, did he stay there or did he move here to New York area? Not, not, not right away. I mean, he, he went to various different places with different bands because he was in the Jimmy Lunsford band for, I don't think he stayed with any band more than two years mm -hmm. because he was hired to arrange for the band, to rehearse the brass section, uh, sometimes to write. He always wrote for every band he was with. Um, and so... And he had some issues with the union where uh, 
I don't know what the story was. I listened to some of my father's stories, and, you know, it doesn't make sense to me because it doesn't happen nowadays. I mm -hmm. mean, not not the way it did back then. So he was, he moved around a bit. He was with, uh, you know, Count Basie's orchestra. He was with um, Artie Shaw for a, a brief minute. He was with Cab Calloway for a couple of weeks, and then he was with Glenn Miller for a little while. He, he arranged in the mood for Glenn Miller. Now, Glenn Miller didn't write in the mood, um, and it was a song that had been around forever. It was never famous, uh, but the, my, the arrangement my father put on it made the song famous. Wonderful. And it was the Glenn Miller Orchestra, you know, that uh, hired him. He wrote Slip On Jive for Glenn Miller. Um, he moved around a lot. He worked for Willie Bryant. Then in the 1940s, he was in Chicago with Sarah McLawla and mm -hmm. the Cinquettes, where they used to... Um, he was her musical director. He wasn't in the band because her band was all women's, always. Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah's bands were always all women bands, and they were always combos. And because of you, we were able to interview Sarah right. McLawler yes. recently, yes. and she was just a pleasure to have here. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the uh, thing I wanted to tell you, they rehearsed at a place called Wally's Paradise in, in Chicago, which is still there. And it was, you know, that's a college, they had a college somewhere nearby. Uh, it was College Town, which, whichever town they were in in Chicago. And Quincy Jones used to come in as a student mm -hmm. and ask to sit in with the band. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Sarah told you that. No. Mm -hmm. And it didn't dawn on her. I says, well, you're Quincy Jones' mentor. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and she says, well, I don't think he really remembers that. <laughs> said, you'd be surprised. People remember their early influences, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um... He moved around a lot. I'm not exactly sure when he first came to New York, but I know that he met my mother in New York, and I was born in 1958. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'm sure he was here before that. But he's he was he's been in New York since, mm -hmm. you know, until he died from, you know, in 1987. Mm -hmm. And when he married my mother, and they had five children. He stopped touring. And he stayed home, and mm -hmm. you know. So he was an older man by that point. He was in his fi he was in his early fifties, and uh, he ran a club out on Long Island um, called Dick Shoots. And there was another club, and he had a liquor license, and so he would run the club mm -hmm. in Long Island. And so he was home, you know, every night, and he was writing. And I remember going to Basie's house, and. You know, mm -hmm. and him coming to our house and, you know, uh, Joe Jones and all those guys hanging out. But my brother knows more of that because he's a guitar player, mm -hmm. you know. He mixed more. Right, yes. Them. And then after, after when I was about 16 or 17, he's, my father uh, joined the Harlem Blues and Jazz Band. And he okay. was with them for 10 or 12 years and, mm -hmm. until he died. And they traveled. They started traveling around the world again. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. How exciting. Yeah. That's really wonderful. So. And and how is it that the hometown contacted you for the park? Well, um, are you active? Uh, yes, with I it? am. Mm -hmm. In 2004 or three, the, the uh, Calaboose African American Museum, which is across the street from where my father was born, which is a lot now, uh, the woman, um, Johnny Armstead, she's, she's passed away since. She contacted me and says, uh, we want to do an exhibit, you know, on your dad. This is his hometown. I'm, an, I'm a, the only black museum in town. And I said, fine. I sent her some artifacts and things for the museum and some photos and whatnot. And um, um, then she told me that she had discovered that the lot across, that the house, at the time there was a house there, shack or something, there was where my father was born and she was curious and this was why she was contacting oh, isn't me. Oh, that interesting? So I said, okay. Um, so she said, we're doing a tribute to him on his birthday if you want to come down. So the, the first year I didn't go um, and then the second year... Like a music festival? You a mean? music, an outdoor mm -hmm. music festival. So mm -hmm. uh, Eddie Durham uh, music festival, excuse me. Wonderful. They had, um, within the year... I just want you to watch your hands oh, okay. with the mic. Mm -hmm. Within the year they established Eddie Durham Day and oh, proclamated isn't that interesting? On Wonderful. August 19th. Wonderful. And, and that's his birthday. That's his birthday, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And they asked me to um, come down and, you know, uh, host the Wonderful. festival. So I that's not only hosted it, but I contacted Sam Ash, and Paul Ash was gracious enough to uh, sponsor part of it. So mm -hmm. I was able to bring my brother's band down, mm -hmm. um, Top Groove, and he performed, and I had Rattlesnake Annie, 
uh, who performed with my father as well and, and the Harlem Blues and Jazz Band and she also uh, re-recorded I Don't Want to Set the World on Fire oh. with, in, in a country genre and it went to the top of the charts. This was Isn't long. That and I, re I remembered her name only from files I had looked at and uh -huh. I said, oh, Rattlesnake Annie, I'll call her because she did I Don't Want to Set the World on Fire and, wonderful. and she was just okay. as wonderful as ever. And then I brought the Harlem Blues and Jazz Band as well. So the whole, that whole festival in 2005 2004 um, was sponsored by Sam Ash. Mm -hmm. and then in 2005, because my dad uh, has Texan Mexican Tex Mex mm -hmm. roots, Interesting. we had um, all Spanish jazz bands, Latin jazz. Oh, interesting. And mm -hmm. um, uh, the Hispanic uh, Cultural Center mm -hmm. of Texas sponsored that year. Then 2006 was my father's centennial year. Uh, because he was born in 1906, so Gee, Sam Ash partially sponsored again, and they released uh, the Eddie Dern signature Centennial guitar. Which, and um, I've, yeah, you have that photo I think mm -hmm. I gave you. And um, so that was really a, a milestone because finally someone had acknowledged that Eddie Durham was the pioneer of electric guitar, pioneer of the amplified guitar, it's wonderful. and, you know, commemorated it with this release. So I've heard your husband play that guitar. Yes. It's really yes. amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. Michael plays this. Michael mm -hmm. Powers is my husband. Mm -hmm. And um, he, uh, they released 10,000 of them. I don't believe there are any left. You have to get them used on eBay or something like that. But mm -hmm. in the F hole, which is the, the mm -hmm. hole, is my signature and my brother's signature. So you'll know if you have an authentic one. Oh, is that interesting? In the hole. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So That's I thought that was really special. It really <laughs> is. A little bit Very of nice. trivia. <laughs> but um, when uh, Miss Armstead passed away a couple of years ago, which was very, very traumatic for me, <clears throat> we became very close. She was like a stepmother to me, mm -hmm. like Sarah is. Mm -hmm. um, Texas State University offered to take over the whole pro program and the mm -hmm. project and that was great because they have the funds and you know to do that and the, the wherewithal to raise the funds whereas Johnny and I were struggling to come mm -hmm. up with sponsors and money every year and um, <clears throat> so they produced it. Texas State University produced an 18 minute uh, short documentary on my dad. They came up here and they interviewed Wonderful. Uh, Lauren Schoenberg and um, Dan Morgenstern from Rutgers University he runs uh, the Institute of Jazz Studies at Rutgers, and um, they uh, put it. It's on the website as well. You can click it and see the 18 minutes. And um, then they proclamated um, something else. <laughs> they do a lot in that town for my dad, but I do attribute a lot of that to the fact that. Uh, it's a small town, it's easy to get things done, mm -hmm. you know. In New York, it's so much red tape to do anything, to get anything done. I mean, sometimes it happens, <laughs> as you know, mm -hmm. you know. You have to sure. be very persistent. Right, you do, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, but we did have a week-long Eddie Durham Jazz Festival at Dizzy's Coca-Cola at oh, Jazz at Lincoln Center. Wonderful. Which uh, Winton and Phil Schaap put it, you know, yeah. their power behind to, to make it happen which was great that was in 2006 as well mm -hmm. and um, you know I'm working now with the Texas Musicians Museum and the uh, American Jazz Museum as well to get some artifacts to you know yeah, whoever mm -hmm. wants them I have tons of stuff so. oh that's really exciting when I was in college I studied accounting and I took extra classes for uh, as electives mm -hmm. and one was the history of jazz okay yeah and um, one of our assignments was to go to a jazz club and write it up you know the program and I went to uh, Blue Note Jazz Club okay. and, and it was for Dizzy, place. Yeah, Dizzy Gillespie was the oh wow yeah. Yeah. Did you know who he was, or you just kind of went? Because I knew I knew of him through the studies, and uh, he. I thought he would be an interesting musician to yes. see. Yes. And I just was overwhelmed with the performance, and mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for that class because it just opened up a whole new world to me. Right. You yes. know, and I still enjoy going to Blue Note Jazz, right. and even for some contemporary artists that I, you know, support. Right. And, well, uh, I have a Dizzy Gillespie story. Uh huh. 
My father wrote a song called Wham, Rebop, Boom, Bam. Mm -hmm. And it's a real catchy uh, swing dance song. Mm -hmm. Wham, Rebop, Boom, Bam. I can swing and I can jam. Wham, Rebop, Boom, Bam. I'm a killer dealer, yes I am. But then there's a part where it goes, dun, 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 dun. And my father said that Dizzy, that salt peanuts, salt peanuts. Oh. Dizzy came to him and asked him about using that riff. Yes, that's okay. Uh, you know, for salt peanuts, salt peanuts. Now, in my father's song, it doesn't say anything. It's just a riff. Uh -huh. And my father said to him, oh, that's nothing. You know, every song's based on another song, so you got it, you know. Then my father tells me later years, he says, yeah, well, you know, I got that from another song. <laughs> so, so he says, that's why I told him. Every song's based on another song. That's great. That was hilarious. That's wonderful. Yeah, Dizzy's daughter lives in the tri-state area. Yes, I know. Yeah. I know. I've met her. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I've, met her. I've seen her in performance when she's rearranged some right. of her father's songs. That's mm -hmm. not fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah, great. Cab, Cab Calloway's uh, grandson, I believe, uh, plays trumpet and leads his band as well mm -hmm. yes but the Harlem Renaissance Orchestra is going to be performing this summer at Midsummer Night Swing mm -hmm. at Lincoln Center and they always do a couple of my father's songs Topsy and wow. um, you know that type of thing and um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of another band it'll come to me later mm -hmm. so yeah. Um, so I want to mention some of the uh, awards. My father has been inducted into the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences, NARIS Hall of Fame, for his arrangement of In the Mood. And he received the Kansas City Jazz Heritage Proclamation from the Kansas City Jazz Commission. Uh, he was the 1986 honoree at Harlem Week, along with Ella Fitzgerald and Dexter Gordon. Wow. I already mentioned that they've proclamated Eddie Durham Day in, in San Marcos and that they are planning to open a park. And I'm hoping to have a gift shop there, oh. you know, where uh, people can come in and I can have film running 24 hours, oh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the opening hours where they can see, you know, the Texas State uh, footage and my own footage because I, I've interviewed... Um, Al Gray and Illinois Jaquette and Phil Schaap and um, Sarah McLawla and Colleen Ray and, um, and these are a lot of the jazz musicians during oh, yeah. the 40s. Big, yes, uh, uh, Benny Powell and Al Gray are you know trombone late trombone players, uh, top of their class mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. Um, do you have an idea when this park will open? Well, they're, they've commissioned the construction to begin this year. Mm -hmm. So I'd say by next, mm -hmm. next spring. Mm -hmm.